Good evening and welcome to the Iacon Foundation International Youth Fellowship Program Information Session. My name is Samir Dosa and I'm an employee at the Aga Khan Foundation and I work on the fellowship program. Tonight we'll be joined by two former fellows, Nabil Ahmed and Faria Megji, who will be sharing their experiences uh, from when they were fellows. The presentations will be followed by a short question answer period, so if you have any questions for us, you can submit them on the Google Hangout or tweet us at AKFC. Before we begin, I would like to introduce our two guests tonight. Um, so we'll start with Faria. Uh, Faria worked in corporate financial planning for two years before embarking on her journey to India and Bangladesh through the Aga Khan Foundation Canada Youth Fellowship Program. In South Asia, Faria worked with CARE with marginalized rural communities in the areas of microenterprise development, agriculture and climate change, food security, as well as women's empowerment. Faria's most notable accomplishment was coordinating the development of a project proposal to the Swiss government for 9 million Swiss francs, which was accepted. Faria is currently working in corporate financial planning in Toronto, but will be pursuing a master's in social work next year. Nabil is a network coordinator for Social Enterprise Toronto, a member-led network of nonprofit social enterprises in the greater Toronto area that create employment and training opportunities for marginalized individuals. As an international microfinance and microenterprise fellow in 2013, Nabil worked as a financial analyst at the University of Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. He has remained active in international development through his work with the Association for the Development of Pakistan and Pakistan. Please join me in welcoming both Faria and Nabil. So we'll start with Faria's uh, presentation. She'll go over her experiences and then that will be followed by Nabil's and then our question and answer period. So I'll just pass it on to Faria now. Awesome. Thank you, Samir. Um, yeah, so I am Faria. I uh, recently finished uh, the Icon Fellowship, um, and I was in South Asia for about 10 months, um, and I came back um, about six months ago. So it, it hasn't uh, been too long, but long enough to kind of um, understand, you know, what the experience was and how it's impacted me. So I'm going to um, share with you a slideshow. I was placed, as Samir said, in India and Bangladesh. Uh, it was a little bit of a um, different experience because I was um, first placed in kind of rural India, um, which was which was different because um, it's a kind of a different lifestyle. So I've outlined some differences in in the environments that fellows are placed in. So some fellows are are placed in more rural rural environments, while some are um, are are placed in more urban environments and as you can tell there's probably um, a big difference in, in your living conditions. So the first thing um, to consider is housing. Um, kind of in urban areas there's more um, of an expat community and therefore there's, you know, I was living in a very nice apartment with, with you know, a hot running shower whereas in rural India I got more of the local experience. Um, you know, taking bucket showers and, and living like um, a lot of the locals do. So both both uh, options have their um, learning experiences and, and growth opportunities. Um, in more of the rural environments, again, you get to spend time with the locals, do more cultural activities, whereas um, in some of the big cities there's lots of expats and you can network um, with them quite a bit. Um, something else that you'll um, notice in the fellowship is the, uh, the difference in food. So a lot of times in, in the rural areas, you know, you have to live with local food, um, which is which is great sometimes. Um, and then in the in the ur more urban places, there's sometimes you feel like you never left because there's a lot of restaurants and places that are very similar to what you're used to back home. Um, in, while I was living in Bangladesh, I was in um, in Dhaka, which is one of like rated one of the least livable cities in the world, and that's due to its air pollution. So that's something to um, think about as well when when you're placed in a rural or urban environment. I was lucky enough to be placed in both to to understand the difference. They're both great learning experiences. 
Um, and like I said, you learn something different for, from both of them. So I'll tell you a little bit um, about my um, work that I did, uh, mostly um, in Bangladesh because I was there for the majority of the time. That's a picture of Bangladesh, and like I was saying, it's quite populated, and there's a lot of pollution, and so that's, uh, as you can imagine, a very different place to live in. <laughs> I do get a lot of questions um, about safety and the AKFC support, um, especially being um, you know, especially being a girl living in, 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 you know, a new country that sometimes has, um, uh, different viewpoints on, on women and, and safety concerns. So, um, the advice I usually give people and new fellows are, is just to be cautious who you're friendly with and, you know, kind of the same things. Don't wander around at, at night. Um, always make a local friend or a few local friends that you trust that know, you know, know what's going on and, and, and where you should stay away from. Um, and then, you know, dressing modestly, not, not standing out too much is always advisable as well. One thing I found, AKFC was very responsive to my, um, any issues I was having. So I was having some issues with the staff um, where I was placed in India. And, and um, it, I told AKFC that I could probably have a better learning experience um, in, in a different placement. And they were very responsive to that and, um, and took me to Dhaka which was, um, there was just, you know, more going on. It was a much better experience. So um, as, a, as a previous fellow, I can vouch for the fact that AKFC has, has your back. So when I was applying for the fellowship, I wasn't completely sure if I'd be sitting at a desk the whole time or if I'd, you know, what, what would exactly I be doing. And so um, I was surprised to see and, and pleasantly surprised to see that there was a lot of opportunities to, to do what we called field visits, which is actually going and visiting the beneficiaries, visiting um, the, the places where they work, where they live, the villages, the farms, and seeing how your, the project you're working on um, is, is being implemented and how it's impacting people. So as you can see here, I visited rug factories, garment factories, farms, and, and villages as well. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, I don't want to go on too long of, of the, you know, exact things that I did, but what you can expect to do, um, at, at least some of the things that, that I did, um, working at um, a, a very large international NGO, was conducting a lot of research and analysis. Um, and this is, you know, on the computer, you know, going through reports, as well as firsthand going to the village and interviewing people and, and doing your own research that way. Um, there's also opportunities to write papers and articles and posters for conferences, um, which is really interesting too because you get kind of your research and what your organization is doing out there. Um, so a couple, so I was, I was mainly placed in um, agriculture projects. Um, I was an IMM fellow, so it was mostly agriculture enter, uh, microenterprise, but as anyone that um, does the fellowship will tell you it uh, there's you know a bunch of different things you can get involved in and um, it's kind of what you make of it um, some other things that I was involved with was uh, developing business cases for um, you know many social enterprises that Kara was setting up um, as well as again interviewing farmer groups and shop owners and all sorts of different stakeholders to um, figure out the best way to implement some of these microenterprises. I also worked on um, some other some other projects, so a project with the ultra poor uh, communities, the villages, um, as well as some garment factory workers. Because as you know, Bangladesh is very um, is very saturated with garment factories, and a lot of the clothes we wear from H and M and Zara and Joe Fresh are, are made in Bangladesh. So um, again, here I I um, got experience in interviewing beneficiaries and formulating survey questions and talking to them, writing case studies about, you know, the success that they're having due to the program, you know, their increases in income, their more nutrition, their health is getting better um, due to, you know, loans that CARE has given them or just, you know, basic education and health services. Another side to development work, um, you know, other than visiting the fields and talking to the beneficiaries, is, is developing proposals, and that's that's a pretty important part um, because that's what's going to allow the organization to implement um, the 
the project. So I was involved with a couple different foundations and, and government institutions, USAID namely to be one, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I wrote a lot of, or I was involved in writing a large chunk of these proposals and um, and uh, and documents to the agencies to to get funds. And I guess um, I think Samir mentioned my biggest accomplishment was um, coordinating the um, the development of a nine million franc project proposal um, that was to provide sixty thousand households access to social and agricultural services. And I was notified after I came back to Canada that they actually won the bid. So that was that was a great moment because I know they're going to do a lot of great things with that with that money. Um, here are just some pictures of of me hanging out with uh, with some people in in the villages, um, and you know showing taking pictures of them and showing them, and they really they really seem to enjoy it. Uh, that's another picture of me with, um, this is in India where there's a lot of tribal folk and um, uh, and, and they, they just have a very rich culture. Um, I like this picture because it paints quite quite a picture of like what's going on. Um, uh, there's just, you know, it's, it's a farm, there's, there's uh, you know, Cow dung being dried on the side there. There's a goat running um, on the, the on the floor on the ground there. That's rice being dried so that um, there because it's already been harvested. So you know that's kind of a, a cool environment to be in and see um, you know firsthand um, how how a lot of these places operate. Finally, I'd like to encourage um, and and I guess inform everyone that there's lots of things to do when you're out of your comfort zone and to seek opportunities outside of work as well. So there's a lot of cool things that you can be involved in in the fellowship, you know, at work, but there's lots of other things too, like I volunteered and consulted with different NGOs and social enterprises. Um, I took classes because it was a lot cheaper in, in India and Bangladesh and like, you know, I'm, I'm interested in music, so I was singing and instruments and yoga and photography. Um, they also, you know, just because I was proficient in English, they would they allowed me to engage in a lot of different activities, like like teaching classes or writing articles for newspapers, um, or you know, being a Canadian uh, singer on a radio station, you know. And so it's just there, there's so many more opportunities there just because you you know you come from from a developed country. Um, and then also, obviously, to travel. All the fellows um, will tell you that it's a great time to travel and, and see the country that you're in and neighboring countries and to, to grow professionally within the fellowship. But it's also um, a very, um, very important kind of opportunity to, to grow personally and broaden your horizons. Um, and that, I think, sums up uh, my fellowship experience. Uh, thank you for, for listening. Thank you, Faria. Next up, we have Nabil. So, Nabil, I want to go Great. So, I'm just going to quickly uh, share my slides as well. So, yeah, thank you, Faria. That was really great. Uh, really interesting kind of hear about you know, the different experiences you had. Um, now, uh, and so I was a fellow beforehand. Uh, and let me start by kind of, just kind of letting everyone know about the place I was in. So, Kyrgyzstan is in Central Asia. And, you know, most people have never heard of it ask people where Kyrgyzstan is, uh, like, um, is it in South America? And you say, no, it's actually between Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, uh, and Kazakhstan, which basically means, for, as far as most people are concerned, it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it's a pretty uh, challenging environment, uh, and, uh, but at the same time, it's incredibly interesting as well. Um, it's a landlocked area. And the project has worked, but it's also incredibly beautiful. Because it's just one of the photos from one of the many hikes that I took. Uh, um, and let me uh, quickly talk about the work that I was doing. So I was at the, uh, I'm just going to pull up the right slide here. Okay, here we are. I was, so I was working for the University of Central Asia. Now, this is one of the biggest projects uh, within the Alcon Development Network. Um, they're investing probably tens of millions of dollars into it. And what essentially we were building was uh, a university across three campuses uh, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, in Kazakhstan, and uh, in Tajikistan. So three campuses in three different countries. So it's a pretty unique partnership. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, the university is scheduled to open uh, this year in, Marin, uh, in, 
in there in yes, uh, the first campus will be open. It's a pretty massive project. It's been going on for a long time. Long time. It, it's, it's the kind of thing that will be around for generations. Think of something like Al Azhar University in Egypt. Uh, hundreds of years after it's uh, it's been completed, people still kind of look at it as an educational institution of repute, and that's probably what's going to happen with the University of Central Asia as well. A hundred years later, people people will be studying in that university and. Thousands of students that have been trained, um, and so the impact that this project can provide is just enormous, enormous. Um, so, what was I doing uh, uh, during my fellowship experience? So, uh, one of the there were a number of kind of roles that I was playing, but it, essentially, uh, while I was uh, at the University of Central Asia, the big focus uh, was um, was construction. And so uh, there was a big financial role during the construction process. So my role included uh, financial analysis for the different grants that we were getting, reporting, budgeting, helping do audits. Uh, I worked pretty closely with the auditors. Um, and then uh, there were a few interesting things that I got to do in particular that I'd like to share. So one was uh, working on presentations um, for the concept of the finance policy. And we were rolling that across the different, uh, across the audience. So this is just a picture of my team there. Um, and this looks like I'm the only um, person who's not from Kyrgyzstan there, but actually it's a pretty diverse team. Part of my role was doing presentations um, and traveling across the different campuses uh, to just train the local teams about essentially financial policy. It sounds really boring, but in some, in some time, uh, sometimes it can get pretty interesting as well. So for example, if you're talking about what is your conflict of interest? Or uh, what is the best way to deal with a situation where there is a potential conflict of interest or breach of confidentiality? Um, these were the kind of mundane things that we were doing, uh, but uh, on a regular basis. Um, the other thing that was, that was really interesting uh, for me to think about was um, student loans. So we know that we're building a university and, and we want quite high quality education, but how can we balance the need for high quality education uh, with access to that education? Uh, because if you want to get the best professors, you have to pay for them. Uh, and to bring a professor in, uh, to Khorok, which is uh, in the foothills of the Himalayas and in the Pamirs, um, which is also a place that is pretty close to uh, you know, a number of earthquakes that have happened in the recent past. To bring a, so how do you uh, how do you chart? And, but at the same time, we know that students in Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan are not necessarily uh, able to afford that. How do you do that? So we're looking at student loans, kind of following the models from around the world. Um, and benchmark, benchmarking with different financial models of different universities around the world are, uh, especially those in, in the global south. So that's uh, a bit of what I did. Um, and I also want to quickly talk about why it is that I applied uh, to this fellowship, and why I chose to uh, travel to Central Asia. Um, because I think it, it's, it's helpful just to kind of uh, think about the, uh, the context. So as Samir mentioned, I was coming into this uh, after a number of years of working in the nonprofit sector, and I had always wanted to get into international development. Uh, so the fellowship uh, was one of several programs that I was considering, uh, as, as most of the people who are watching this webinar will know that it's not the only fellowship program of its kind in the world. But you know what? In a in number of ways, it is the only fellowship program of its kind. And I say that because, I mean, you could compare it to any number of programs that are out there, uh, such as the Acumen Fellowship, for example. What I would really say about this one is, A, it's been around for 27 years. It's a pretty long track record. Most people who are applying for the fellowship are younger than the program itself. So that's a lot of institutional knowledge that has been built up over the decades. The second thing is that they start off with a month of training and development. And that management seminar and audit that takes place before you actually go off to the field is super valuable. Uh, you learn a great deal from that. Uh, I, I actually also knew a number of people who had done the fellowship in the past, and they really encouraged me uh, to take on the, uh, the fellowship experience. Um, which was uh, fantastic for me. Um, and since then, the fellowship has helped me build a stronger 
understanding the population of the um, So I'm going to quickly then move on to talking about uh, what are some of, what were some of the highlights of the fellowship. Program. One of the things is definitely just understanding what the BRB HLC network are, uh, and some uh, some key lessons that I have. Uh, one is that you know the real international development work is incredibly tough, uh, and and not what most people think it is. Um, another one is that context is critical. So the same solution that very well in India, but not necessarily work well in Bangladesh, even though they're right next to each other, and definitely won't work well in West Africa. Um, the other point uh, is that uh, people are people everywhere. I was actually reading an interesting article earlier today that made a, made a good point, which was um, if, if I came to someone and said, I want to address the issue of, uh, let's say, homelessness in Toronto, um, you know, I would be, um, I would be, I would tell them uh, it's not it's not as easy as you think it is. There's lots of good reasons for why those issues exist, but we don't always take that approach and assign that complexity to work in international development. Uh, it's not as easy as just going there. It's not as easy as just uh, funding something interesting. There's a lot more complexity to it. Beyond that, for me, I work like my understanding of the world of development and the concepts of it. It was a travel. Personally, this was just such a great experience as well. So, you know, watching, uh, watching a group of uh, people. So this is in the foothills of Songku. Songku is a lake, one of the highest lakes in the world. Uh, this is near the hills of Songku. Uh, and there was a game of Kokpur, which is, uh, which is in Afghanistan by Queen of Kashi. This is another version of that game. Just the travel was fantastic. Uh, learning how to speak Russian, um, uh, having to uh, meet uh, new people and understand their ways of thinking, um, you know, understanding the challenges that people face when they don't have access to water, and electricity, twenty four seven, was uh, was absolutely huge. Um, I, I was quite privileged in that I got to travel to different parts uh, of Central Asia as well during the fellowship. Um, you know, I, I love hiking, so I got a, I got a lot to do, I got to do a lot of that. Personally, I, I enjoy cooking and I really love that during the fellowship experience as well. So, those are just some of the, uh, I guess, highlights of my experience. Um, and as I end, I guess like I'll just make a, a final point about who should be applying for this fellowship. Why should you be thinking about it? And um, think if you're someone who is interested in the issues. Um, if you're someone who is uh, has uh, always uh, you know thought about uh, what uh, international development issues, uh, uh, initiatives are out there and how to contribute in a meaningful way, uh, this is a great way to test your uh, to test uh, to test that out and see if you are up for the challenge. Um, I'll pause there. Uh, thank you uh, for listening so far, and I look forward to your questions. Samir, back to you. We'll move on to the question and answer portion of the webinar. So the first most top voted question is from Dara J. Fontaine. And her question is, based on your experience, what qualities would you would make you a good AKFC fellow? This is for both of you. Well, I'll, I'll take a go. Um, I think I, I had asked this question to a previous fellow when I was applying and he had told me that the quality that makes you a really good AKFC fellowship candidate is your flexibility and adaptability and um, I thought that was that was so true because there's just so much that you will have to adapt to and um, learn to be comfortable with and just have an open mind and, and kind of go in head first um, and so I think that's kind of the that's that's a really important quality to be able to make the best of situations. Um, I remember there was a, a time in Bangladesh where there was a lot of political unrest, so I had to um, work. I wasn't allowed to leave my apartment, so I couldn't go to work. And um, I just I had to make the best of that situation. So I tried to still get involved remotely and things like that. So there's going to be a lot of curveballs that are going to change a lot of what you think what you thought you were going to do or where you even thought you were going to live. 
So um, to be able to quickly adapt to that and um, and still be successful and get a lot out of the fellowship, I think that's one of the, the best qualities. Yeah, I'll just, uh, let me just add quickly my uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, so I, I would agree with essentially what uh, what you said, uh, Faria. Um, it's an openness to risk and you know, being out of your comfort zone. Because if you're the kind of person who really can't get by without, you know, your daily dose of your daily cappuccino, then, um, you know, this work is not for you. Um, and I think one thing that really helps here is kind of having a sense of purpose. Uh, if you care about this work, you get it done. And if you don't care, uh, you, know, you could be in the most luxurious environment possible, and you still won't enjoy it. You still won't be able to contribute. Uh, so that's the other thing I would say. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, this question is from Rihanna T, and the question is, it would be great to know more about the training you received before you left and how you felt upon returning from your fellowship. Did you feel prepared for the placement and a career in development? Uh, was it hard to readjust to being back in Canada? There's a few questions there, so um, let's start with the first one. Um, just so just, just to give you a little bit of background, all successful candidates are required to attend a one-month uh, international management, international development management training seminar held in Ottawa. So it is uh, pretty much a crash course on development that has like industry leads come in and facilitate sessions on things like monitoring and evaluation, um, uh, just the history of development, uh, microfinance. Uh, mental health and resilience while in the field, um, cultural integration, just a variety of topics that we feel at AKFC would prepare you for the fellowship. And I'll pass it over to Faria and Nabil to uh, just get their idea of how they felt that helped them prepare for the fellowship field placement. So I'll, I'll take a go at that again. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't come from an international development background, so I haven't been um, I, I wasn't too like I haven't taken a lot of courses or anything in, in, in all the areas that Samir mentioned like health and rural development um, and so it was a really good overview of, of what I would see in, in the field um, and it, it helped me prepare to get that perspective and, and understand the issues that are that are in development in the developing world and, and the kind of issues that NGOs face. Um, there's also um, like the cultural training, being able to understand different dimensions of culture and how different people react to different situations, that helped me understand how my coworkers were behaving and, and their kind of organizational skills and just, you know, helped me understand and accept the way they were because it was very different from what I was used to. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I think I, I the training was really uh, in a number of ways. Uh, even though I was coming from a perspective where I... Uh, uh, I was fairly familiar with development concepts. Um, I think uh, the, the, the training helped to refresh some of those and really kind of frame them in the right way. So, for example, I wasn't as aware of kind of the way that gender issues are spoken about and how they should be addressed in an international development context. Um, and most importantly, uh, you built incredible relationships with fellows and um, who remain my friends and who are some of the most wonderful, critical people I know. And those with the relationship really helped me throughout the fellowship process and afterwards as well, um, still to this day. One of the other things that the, the training really helped, uh, uh, I think, uh, just the uh, ability to kind of prepare for culture shock. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a metaphor that it's, uh, might recognize the metaphor of an iceberg, right? And recognizing that, you know, there's many, many different layers that you have to go through. Um, so that was really helpful. And in, some, in one way, to be honest, the question is about, it's like the difference between going from school to real life. Uh, you have to be resourceful. You have to look for opportunities. You have to take initiatives and make things work for you. Um, because no one's going to hand you things that are sort of such a pattern. That said, you do get great opportunities coming out of the fellowship, um, especially if you want to use it as a stepping stone for working in international development. Thank you, Nabil. Um, we'll move on to the second part of that question, where Rihanna asked, um, how did it prepare you for working in development after um, post-fellowship? Like, what were your experiences post-fellowship? Um, 
if you guys could talk a little bit about that. So the first, uh, I think the most important one is that it helped me understand what I did want to do and what I did not want to do. So um, if, uh, you know, if you're looking from a development lens, it helped me understand that, you know, maybe uh, you know, reporting for donors was not the area of expertise that I wanted to specialize in, but maybe working on urban development issues was something that I, wanted, that I cared about. Um, and it was definitely challenging when I came back uh, looking for jobs. Uh, there are some uh, support, there are uh, some forms of support that AKFC offers, but uh, really uh, the biggest support is the value of the AKFC brand. Uh, people recognize the work of the AKDN around the world. Uh, people recognize the work that the Alpha Development Network has done. Uh, and once you speak to people uh, and are looking for jobs, they will assign some value to that. That makes it easier in, in a number of ways. Um, but if, I mean, if you don't want to work in development, of course, uh, then the point is moot. Uh, then it's really your experience of living abroad and uh, being, um, you know, you, through doing the fellowship, you've proven that you are uh, flexible and can take risk, which is valuable in its own way. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our next question. Um, this question is from Sadek Sumar. And his question is, what international volunteer experiences, if any, did both of you have before going on these assignments? Uh, for me, it was um, so uh, having gone to university in Pakistan and having lived and studied there for about four and a half years, I had volunteered for a number of organizations there, uh, both in humanitarian relief, uh, with the, the earthquake in 2005, uh, as well as uh, the floods in 2010. Um, and I had been working with the Association for Development of Pakistan for a number of years. I hadn't traveled abroad, but I had lived abroad and worked with uh, organizations um, uh, as a volunteer in the past. Uh, so that really helped me uh, for the fellowship program. Um, I actually was one of the few people that didn't have any um, international volunteer development experiences. I'd actually never um, even visited a developing country uh, prior to my um, pri prior to the AKFC fellowship so I, I feel very lucky to have been um, you know chosen as as a candidate um, even though I didn't I didn't have that I did however um, I did do like an international exchange in university in in Portugal and um, I guess I, I re that's kind of how I displayed my ability to uh, get out there and you know not be too risk averse and be open minded to different cultures and be open to living in a different place for six months, a year, um, and being able to integrate within that. So that's kind of the only experience I had, but uh, you know, a lot of the other fellows had, uh, had other volunteer experiences. Thank you, Faria. Um, our next question is from Daniel Z. Adams, and his question is based on your experience, what makes an IYFP application stand out? So I'll give you my perspective uh, from the review side. We look for applications where um, individuals can showcase that they've been innovative, creative, and have done something out of the ordinary. We don't look for the smartest people or the people with the most experience. We look for people who stand out and who we genuinely feel will make a change and will benefit greatly from this experience. So if you can talk about something that you've done that you are particularly proud of or something that you started up yourself. Um, we really appreciate that entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship in some cases and just that ability to stand out from the crowd. Um, yeah, I think um, I think definitely, you know, someone that, that thinks creatively, someone that I, I think the main thing is someone that has the passion and desire and that comes through in the application, that comes through in the interview and that comes through in the management seminar and then your, your work subsequent to that. So it's just that you know, real desire to help. It's not that you want a vacation. It's not that you want, um, you know, a cool experience, which it is a cool experience, but it, it's a lot of it is that um, that desire to help and the passion for social causes and uh, and the knowledge of, of what's going on in the world and, and, you know, different innovative things that are happening in the development space. Yeah, I'll echo that. Uh, it's really, I think, uh, the curiosity and, and passion you bring uh, to this experience, you know, curiosity and the world around you, uh, and, and 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 evidence of having had that curiosity, right? Not having developed a curiosity in the last five days, then you, you know, so um, you know, 
if, if you can show that you know you kind of taught, you've taught a little bit about the issues uh, and you've, you've taught about development and you are seriously considering it as something that you know you could make a meaningful contribution to it's worth it right um, and that's I think pretty it comes through in a number of ways it's it's kind of unquantifiable uh, but I mean if you if you only started thinking about let's say poverty in the last two weeks uh, and uh, you know your only perception of health is that you know maybe you can donate some old clothes uh, you know that doesn't necessarily show the level of commitment that might be helpful our next question comes from Rihanna T and her question is can you tell us about the biggest challenges you faced uh, biggest surprise you encountered and the biggest lesson you learned um, I'm assuming during your fellowship okay um, I I think the biggest challenge I faced initially was um, in my placement in India and I had a very difficult co-worker there and and I'm sure a lot of fellows will have difficult co-workers um, um, and, and, and in addition to the difficult co-worker there was also um, a lack of work and and that's something that you know fellows may or may not encounter sometimes the um, you know AKFC does a great job in trying to make sure that the fellow will be busy with meaningful work but sometimes you know the international organizations don't quite know how to receive a fellow and 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 um, give them meaningful work because you know they might have not done it before so um, I think a big part of it is to to be to voice to be assertive and to voice your um, your opinion and voice what you what you want from the fellowship so if I you know I was working on agriculture projects and after a while I was like oh you know I don't want to work for agriculture projects anymore I want to do something more in the um, garment factory and women empowerment space so I went to my manager and I told him that and so without without um, without going and taking the initiative to find what you want um, it's not it's not going to happen and that's true for for really anything in life but especially true in the fellowship because the opportunities are endless people will let you experience what you want to experience so you just have to um, you know you kind of have to find work sometimes and and make of it what, what you will uh, this is, I mean this is a hard question uh, it's a good one so uh, I guess like for me the biggest challenge was how long some things took uh, you know you have to go through layers and layers of political bureaucracy and Kind of deal with the government officials. And, uh, for me, that was challenging. And another challenge, and you know, I know I'm not sticking to the biggest challenge, but it was the language. Uh, you know, I did not speak Russian, and so it was difficult to uh, kind of interact with a lot of people in Bishkek. Um, but I did learn Russian, which is a lot of fun. Um, at least some of it. Uh, um, biggest surprise is how little we know about. Areas outside North America. If you look at that on a daily basis, Central Asia is very news, right? Even though there's some pretty interesting important things happening there, there's some huge stories that come out there that you don't know anything about. And the biggest lesson, I guess, was just that you have to be patient and kind of approach this work with humility. This is a long term game. You can't just kind of go into the dance floor and say, I'm going to knock everything off. I'm going to answer a few questions about the logistics behind the, uh, the timeline, the funding, all that kind of thing. Um, so basically the way it works is applications will close February 1st. Uh, we will do application review for the month of February and we'll start interviews for all three streams mid-February and they will continue to mid-March. Offers for placements will go out end of March, early April. and um, the management seminar will take place for the month of June in Ottawa. Field placements will begin in, in sorry, in August, uh, beginning to mid-August, and they will go until um, April or Mar end of March of the following year. Uh, fellows are also required to come back, or what part of the fellowship is there able to come back for the management seminar the following year to talk about their experiences with outgoing fellows. Um, your, so your contract with AKFC is for the fellowship, but you are essentially doing a job. You're going to be working with the host organization. Um, they're going to be providing you with tasks and roles and responsibilities. And AKFC's job is to main, mainly facilitate the fellowship process, 
Uh, make sure you guys are comfortable, have all your needs met. If there's any issues with your supervisor, then you can come to us and we can facilitate a, a forum for you guys to kind of solve those issues. In terms of uh, asking for time off and things like that, that would be need to be done through your local office and would be discussed with your local supervisor. For funding, uh, this is a Global Affairs Canada funded project. All fellowships are fully funded, so this means that we take care of, um, you get an eight months living stipend while in the field and you also get a living stipend while in Ottawa. This covers rent, food, um, uh, basic necessities like internet, Wi-Fi, electricity, and um, travel to and from work. And a small, whatever's left over you can use for whatever you feel. So all expenses are covered mostly by AKFC. In terms of references, a few of you have asked about um, if you do not have enough references, can you still apply? You can still apply. Uh, you need a mandatory of a personal reference in order to be eligible for the program. If you're lacking an academic or professional reference, you will be deducted points and you may not be considered competitive. But you can still apply and if you have a strong enough application, then we will, um, our reviewers will let us know and we'll uh, definitely consider you for an interview. Um, we'll move on to another question now. This question is from Matin313. Did you learn the language of the country you went to before you went, and what language difference was language difference a problem? Um, okay, I'll I'll go first. Um, so I so I went to India initially, and um, luckily I was already fluent in Hindi, so that wasn't too much of an issue. Obviously, there's different dialects in different parts of the world, but that you know, living in India was not an issue linguistically. I mean, they could tell I wasn't from there because of my accent, but it wasn't an issue in Bangladesh. However, um, they don't understand Hindi all so much, um, but Bangla is kind of a it's a sister language, I guess. So I did I did try to pick up some of it, um, you know, just just enough. So sometimes you need. The link, you know, a lot of places, especially Indian Bangladesh, that have been, um, you know, that were colonialized for so long. There, you know, the signs are in English. Or, you know, English is not, um, you know, people generally people know some English. So you don't, you only need to know it for, you know, shopkeepers or restaurants or, um, you know, taxi drivers. But for the most part, you know, I learned I learned that kind of language, the very basic um, vocab. Um, and that should hopefully help you get by in a lot of places, unless they're really uh, rural. Yeah, I think I mentioned this earlier as well. I learned, uh, I, learned, uh, I, I did all my language learning after I got there. And in fact, the process of learning was really helpful for me to understand the culture uh, of the place as well. Uh, because I, you know, I was interacting with a Russian tutor. Uh, my first tutor was actually Russian. The second tutor was Kyrgyz. Um, and they were, you know, just interacting with them helped me help socialize me to the place as well. Um, it was a challenge, but uh, it was a little bit of work. And it was, and it was uh, really incredible. Um, near the end of my fellowship, I was actually able to travel to uh, a different city, which was a 10-hour bus ride away, uh, all by myself, uh, and spent three days there, where I knew no one. Uh, and I didn't know anyone who spoke English at all. Um, and they only spoke in Russian, and I was able to so, uh, it was challenging. Thank you, Nubia. Uh, our next question comes from Sadiq Bezan, um, and their question is, as a fellow, how much of a say do you have in choosing the country of your fellowship? So once you complete the application, uh, you within the application there's a, a little box which you can say, I'm uh, open to going to these countries or not open to going to these countries. Uh, as reviewers, we take that into consideration, but at the end of the day, we look at your skill set and we make the offers based on where we feel you would be the most fit. So in terms of how much say you have in what country you go to, it's almost no say. Um, however, if you do get an offer and you're not open to going to that country, then you can pass on your feedback and we can um, definitely look at other options. But in terms of if you want to go to Tanzania and you make that clear to us and we don't feel that you would be the best fit for a Tanzania placement, uh, you wouldn't necessarily get that uh, placement. Our next question is from Catherine LeMay. If you could go back in time, is there, <clears throat> is there anything you would have done differently? 
So uh, I guess I'll, uh, that's, that's again a very good question. Uh, one of my biggest kind of fears is doing the project is basically from missing out because I knew that I had nine months and I had to do everything in that time. Um, I really try to do a lot. I, I guess I might try to plan some things in advance better, learn about some of the opportunities, uh, some of the things that I could be doing in my whole country in advance. Um, but uh, otherwise, I don't think I would change. Like maybe I would be a little more assertive during the fellowship without kind of asking for what I wanted to do and kind of going to my manager and saying I want to do X, Y, and Z. Um, Coming up with my initiative and projects and pushing them forward. Um, but uh, those are the two things. One is basically more research and kind of being more assertive. Um, okay, what I would have done differently, I think um, I would have maybe you know taken more opportunities to learn more. So you're in a different country and there's lots of different things to learn. Um, and I would have maybe gotten involved in, in, in some different things sooner. So for instance, um, I wrote an article for the newspaper in, in Bangladesh. Um, and that's cool because I've, you know, I've always interested in writing, but you know, I'm not really a journalist in Canada, but hey, I can be a journalist in, in Bangladesh. Or you know, I, I taught some classes at the international schools there. I'm not a teacher in Canada, but I, you know, they'll let me be a teacher in, in Bangladesh. So there's just the things like that that you're, you know, I could have um, taken more advantage of. Like I wanted to maybe make a documentary or, you know, record some music or, um, you know, be more involved with local NGOs. And, you know, there's just so many opportunities. And um, I, you know, right off the get-go, I mean, you take time adjusting and everything. Um, but if you if you go into the mindset that yeah I'm going to work and the and you know you go to work and the fellowship is great but there's lots of other you know learnings you can have in that country um, and other experiences too so I'd go in with the mindset to just you know try to experience as much as possible and learn as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two more questions. So our next question is from Jenny Liu, and the question is. Uh, what are your career goals now that you have completed the AKFC fellowship? That's a that's a great question. I feel like um, I I wasn't you know going into the fellowship. I'd quit my job in in corporate finance, and I wasn't quite sure um, where where I was gonna go after the fellowship. But I read this um, quote online on the AKFC website for the fellowship, and it said something like um, a quote from a previous fellow that said, or something, and it said something like 90% or 80% of previous fellows say that the AKFC fellowship helped them direct their career, um, their career goals and their, and their, you know, life afterwards. And so I was like, oh, well, this is great. This will help me, you know, give me some direction in my career goals. And, and it did. So, you know, I, um, and I think Nabil talked about you kind of realize what you like and what you don't like. So I didn't like so much the writing reports and, and proposals um, and budgets, but I did like going onto the field and, and talking to the beneficiaries and, you know, talking about serious issues and emotional issues. Um, and when I came back to Canada, I realized that there's a lot of these issues, you know, like domestic violence and poverty and food insecurity. There's a lot of these issues in Canada and as well as abroad. And I decided that I wanted to um, kind of, you know, do more like field work and, and help in that way. And so that's why I want to pursue um, a social work degree to be able to do that in Canada and, and abroad. So I got more clarity as to as to how I want to, you know, impact. Um, and that's, you know, that's due to the fellowship. Um, I guess I spoke about this a little bit earlier as well. But um, yeah, I definitely got a better sense of what I wanted to do. And uh, I guess the question was like, what are my career goals now? And so my career goals uh, before as well were to support the work of support the work of great nonprofits and social enterprises and that remains I you know uh, and but in particular I, I want to take that to the end, uh, that work uh, in the international to the international development space as well where you know we're kind of bringing a critical lens to the work of social enterprises and questioning uh, you know how we can improve that um, and uh, supporting collaboration this is for me one of the number one things that you know gets me uh, you know uh, annoyed at, the, at you know good work so to speak um, I mean the other so one of the things is just the lack of collaboration and fragmentation 
in the nonprofit sector and in the social enterprise sector. There's too much competition and not enough collaboration. Uh, and the other thing is just people who don't know enough about the work they're doing. Uh, and so the need for educating people uh, about development. Uh, so in my work, I, I want to be, uh, you know, engaging uh, citizens more effectively uh, and uh, working on more effective collaboration uh, between uh, social enterprises and nonprofits. Our last question is from Mark Lombardo. In the past, have fellows been hired to continue working with their employer after their fellowship was completed? So uh, I'll answer this question. Um, so a lot of fellows are extended into field placements if they can prove that they can build capacity in their host organization. This is not very common, but it has happened in the past. Um, being a part of the fellowship also gives you a little bit of, um, gives you like a stamp of approval. We have quite a few fellows working in our office currently. We have quite a few fellows working within the institutions. They may not work with our institutions directly after the fellowship, but the fellowship gives them like the step up to go get some more experience and then come back and um, work with us. So it's not a guarantee, but if you show initiative, if you show that you're willing to work hard and you understand the core ethics of our organization, then you are definitely, um, uh, you have a very good chance of, you know, possibly securing employment with us in the future. Um, I don't know if Faria or Nabil, you, you two have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I know um, prior to, to, to me going to Bangladesh, the previous fellow worked, um, worked at, at CARE um, for a year after the fellowship was done, employed by CARE, and I, I was employed for about a month um, as to develop a proposal after the fellowship. So um, in addition to AKFC, like, uh, you know, the, the host organization sometimes um, hires, hires the fellow, you know, for additional time um, if, if the fellow is interested in it and it's a good fit. Thank you, Faria. So we've come to the end of our, our webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We hope it was useful and informative. Um, moving forward, if you have questions, you can tweet us at AKFC, or you can email us at fellowships at akfc.ca. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a good one. Thanks, Mia. Thanks.